thank you all for coming and joining us after your lunches. Just like with C++ itself, at the Gaylord Rockies, there are no free lunches. Yeah. I am uh, Eric Niebler. Uh, if you know me at all, you probably know me as um, the ranges guy. I'm not talking about ranges today, though. I'm going to be talking about something else, something that I've been working on for the past year and a half, two years now. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, yeah, and this is? I'm David Holman uh, from Sandia National Labs. Um, I've been working on parallel and distributed programming models for uh, about five years now since I finished graduate school. So uh, we're coming from completely different directions in this talk, and hopefully that'll come through and show the universality of the abstraction we're working on here. Yeah, so David and I are going to be trading off uh, our speaking duties, um, you know, tag team, I'm going to tag him. Um, but uh, he and I are kind of like the async odd couple. Um, <laughs> David speaks parallelism uh, fluently. Uh, I speak concurrency with a, a bit of an accent. Um, preparing this talk has been actually uh, kind of challenging. This is, uh, you know, it, it, it takes us a while to actually reach a mutual understanding because we come from such opposite ends of the spectrum. But yeah, like David said, um, what's so exciting about what we're working on is we think that it can actually bridge this, this gap. And maybe you don't uh, immediately understand exactly what the difference between concurrency and, and parallelism is, um, but uh, David's going to uh, try to uh, close the, the gap for us. So what we're going to be talking about is um, async abstractions. So you're all familiar with the STL. Uh, you're all familiar with the iterator abstraction and how it has um, unified the worlds of um, containers and algorithms. Um, C++ is becoming increasingly an, uh, an asynchronous language. Asynchrony is becoming more and more important. And in fact, in C++23, we are hoping um, that the standard library will have many more um, capabilities uh, that are asynchronous. Uh, so we really need to find that thing that is like an iterator, but for async, something that lets us write generic asynchronous algorithms. So this talk is a little bit about the committee's search uh, to find the fundamental basis operations that will let us express asynchrony uh, generically. So uh, these are the requirements for an async abstraction. It better be composable. Uh, it should have low abstraction overhead. It should work with coroutines or fibers or threads or whatever else. And it should be extensible to multiple execution environments, thread pools, or GPUs, or uh, CPUs, um, your parallel runtimes, whatever, concurrency and parallelism both. So I should say, uh, to start with, that um, this talk doesn't represent the official views of um, WG21. Uh, this is, I'm presenting some of the big ideas behind some of the recent papers. Um, that have been uh, working their way through committee, uh, but you know nobody has um, made a final decision yet on uh, the way things are going to go. And a second disclaimer: you will see C style casts in this talk. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> With that, I'm going to hand it over to David, and he's going to fill you in a little bit on the difference between concurrency and parallelism. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about, and this is, this is really a um, pivotal part of our talk, um, for me at least. Uh, I, I think I want to try and give the room a feel for um, why we think what we have is actually universal. And to really understand that, I think you need to have a pretty decent understanding of the difference between parallelism and concurrency. Uh, they're very much not the same thing, um, and in many ways opposites. And um, so I'm going to show this three different ways, so don't worry if you don't get it the first time. I'm going to come back at it again and then try again. Um, but uh, So let's get started. So pictorially speaking, um, the squiggles in these pictures are tasks, right? Um, and uh, concurrent mechanisms like uh, std thread or std async imply this unknown set of intertask dependencies that the scheduler has to manage. Uh, you may have heard the term concurrent forward progress guarantee. That basically means that no matter what these threads do, um, within some constraints, they have to make progress, the program has to complete. Um, and so, in a sense, the, these unknown intertask dependencies uh, are 
like a lossy abstraction, right? They're kind of like type erasure, but for concurrency, right? Um, you're, or but for parallelism and concurrency, but for, or type erasure for async. I mean, they are a, uh, a lossy abstraction. Parallelism is the opposite of that in a sense, in that it uh, involves a promise by the user to the scheduler that there are none of these inner task dependencies, uh, right? So that means that the scheduler has the freedom to schedule these threads however it wants. And, and you know, one option is to just take all of these I'm sorry, I'm using the term thread, I mean task, because um, thread specifically implies something in C++, so I shouldn't say that. But uh, task, the scheduler can, could, one of the allowed schedules is this, this, this third one over here, uh, where it just decides to run them all backwards, right? That is, a, that is a form of parallelism. It does not necessarily imply any kind of simultaneous lifetime or anything like that, right? Parallelism is a promise by the user. Um, all right, pass number two. Uh, this one with source code. Uh, so concurrency. So this is a kind of a hand-wavy program. I'm not using the term thread here again because uh, if I use the term thread, this is kind of a tautology, right? It's the threads are always concurrent in C++. So uh, I just use worker or task. Um, and so if this program, these workers, do not provide a concurrent forward progress guarantee, then this program is not guaranteed to complete, right? It's not guaranteed to finish. Never guaranteed to print hello, right? So on the left, we're, we're spinning on uh, some atomic, and on the right, we're setting that atomic, right? And, and if the user has told the uh, scheduler that these two are parallel, then the scheduler can just keep scheduling task A, keep scheduling task A, keep scheduling task A, and the, the program may never complete. So generally speaking, concurrency imposes extra requirements on the scheduler, um, and it grants the user extra freedoms for the kinds of things they can do in their tasks. Parallelism, again, kind of opposite, right, is that uh, if the user has told the scheduler that these two uh, tasks are parallel, then the scheduler is allowed to do something like end up with these x equals one or x equals two uh, in this program, right? Uh, so parallelism is a contract that grants extra freedom to the scheduler, right? And so if the user is okay with x equals one or x equals two, then this is a correct program for parallelism. But if the user wants x equals two every time, then the user has to impose, uh, it imposes extra constraints on the user's code, right? These have to be atomics. Um, all right, pass number three. I've said opposites a bunch of times here, and this is what I really mean by opposites. We have a, a spectrum here from less freedom to the scheduler to more freedom to the scheduler, or more freedom to the user, way over on the left, and uh, more freedom to the, uh, less, less freedom to the user way over on the right, more requirements on the user on the right. So over here on the left, we have concurrency, right? Uh, over here on the right, we have parallelism. And here's the key to understanding the difference here. Right in the middle, we have serial execution, plain old serial execution, right? So this is the sense in which these things are opposites. So let me try and drive that point home. Uh, Concurrency is a stronger scheduling guarantee than serial, right? So if these are our tasks, one way to serialize these tasks, one way to schedule them serially would be like this. And I am confident pretty much everyone in this room knows this program to the right never terminates, right? Never finishes, never prints hello. Um, but if worker A and worker B are supposed to be concurrent, are told to be concurrent, that program has to, ex has to print hello, has to eventually terminate. So concurrency is a stronger scheduling guarantee than serial. Parallelism is the opposite in this respect, right? Parallelism is a weaker guarantee. So if I tell, just like I said before, if I, if I tell the scheduler that these two tasks are parallel, then it's allowed to have x equals two or x equals one. But if I turn it into a serial program, right, 
I am strengthening the scheduling requirement, and I always get x equals 2. Everyone in this room knows that that program produces x equals 2. So in a sense, parallelism is more universal. What do I mean by that? A program written so that its requirements are expressed for concurrency are explicit is more expressive than one that uses concurrent mechanisms like std thread implicitly, right? Um, so when you use concurrent features to express parallelism, you end up with unreasonable and implicit overheads that can't be removed because of these implicit guarantees. And the programming model um, that uses concurrency directly rather than using parallelism directly is, uh, and then inserting concurrency explicitly, is uh, not restrictive enough for the compiler, the runtime system, the scheduler to remove these overheads. So yeah, when I say scheduler, I, I, I mean both um, aspects of the scheduler that live in the compiler, like the vectorizer, and aspects of the scheduler that live at runtime. So in C++ 17, we got these, the parallel algorithms, right? Uh, and why are these parallel algorithms faster than just doing the same thing with a thread pool or with threads? And it's because something like std par and seek tells the scheduler and the compiler that there are no implicit dependencies between the tasks, right? And so on the, uh, in the thread case, even if there are no implicit dependencies between the tasks, the scheduler is forced to assume that there might be because it's, an Im it's implied by the fact that you used a concurrent mechanism. So in other words, par the, the parallel algorithms uh, allow us to communicate the full structure of the algorithm's task graph to the scheduler a priori, right? And this is, this is a, a critical aspect of obtaining performance out of these things, right? Uh, so uh, Eric's going to now jump back in, and he's going to kind of build from a ground up uh, this universal abstraction that we have, and hopefully tie back in to the end to show why this is a more universal approach um, for expressing parallelism and why it expresses concurrency explicitly in all the right ways. So I'm going to pass this off to Eric. And thank you, David. Now, I'd like uh, to stick a pin in this discussion for a bit, and I'm going to start talking about something um, a little different. I'm going to talk about this asynchronous abstraction that we've been referring to, which we call senders and receivers. And I'm going to illustrate what senders and receivers are by first talking about something that aren't senders and receivers, which are uh, futures and promises. Now, I will posit that futures are slow. Now, why? Why are futures slow? Let's, uh, look at, let's look at a program that, uh, that uses um, promises and futures. And I apologize in advance for the contrived uh, examples in this presentation. Uh, it turns out it's pretty hard to uh, come up with convincing um, examples of concurrency because they generally don't fit on slides. Um, but here's a really dumb asynchronous algorithm. It returns a future. Let's imagine for the sake of argumentation that this is a a future like a, a boost future. Boost future is a, a little bit more general than, uh, than a standard future in that it, it lets you attach a continuation to it. So you first create a promise, and you get a future from that promise, and then this algorithm launches a thread. It uses a concurrency mechanism. And from within that thread, it does some asynchronous computation, and eventually set the value on that promise. Well, that will make it pop out the other end on the future, right? So we detach the thread and we return the future to the caller. So the caller now can go execute other code and eventually um, block on that future to get the um, value um, uh, when it's done. So you would use an algorithm like this from main by calling the algorithm and saving it off in a, uh, in a future. And then you might add a continuation, right? So f dot then here, and you pass it a function object. This is a function that's going to get invoked automatically when um, the uh, uh, asynchronous algorithm has finished computing its result and called a set value on the promise. And then there's another method on the future. Oh, and when we do that, when we call dot then, we get back a second future. Now, eventually we'll be able to call uh, dot get on that future to block 
wait for that computation and its continuation to finish, and then print the result. So that's what's happening here. So let's look here at, um, at what's really going on under the covers and discover why futures and promises are slow. So futures and promises are two ends of a communication channel, right? So they need to communicate with each other somehow, so they need a shared state in order for them to communicate, so that's an allocation. All right, so you allocate this shared state, and it's gonna have a slot for the value, it's gonna have a slot for the continuation, but now you have two concurrent threads of execution, right? And they're both gonna try to access the shared state at the same time, when you set the value, and when you add a continuation. All right, they're both gonna try to read the continuation field in this shared state. That means you've got potentially concurrent shared access on um, the same memory. And that means you need synchronization, which is why you have a mutex and a condition variable also in this uh, shared state. Right. So, okay, um, whoops, got ahead of myself. So that means we've got allocation, we've got synchronization, right? We also need a reference count here because you have the same object being referenced by two other objects, right? So you need ref count. Now there's one other thing. The continuation, when this shared state is created, right, we don't know what is the type of the continuation that's going to get attached, okay? So this continuation field has to be type erased. Why is type erasure slow? Right, type erasure is slow because it's another allocation probably, uh, and also because it um, uh, involves an indirect function call, which the compiler can't see through. Okay, so we got one allocation, two allocations, we got synchronization, we got reference counting, we got indirect function calls. Wow, this is a really heavyweight abstraction. So how successful would the STL be if all iterators did allocation, synchronization, and type erasure? It would be a disaster. Think about what it would be like to use an STL where there was only one iterator type. All the containers had to return exactly the same type. And all that iterator did was type erasure and virtual function calls, and it was terrible. Right? You would never want to use this abstraction. Right? And so that's what stood future is. That's what boost future is. When you have APIs that return futures, you are making a decision for the user to pay this cost, when maybe the, uh, the user doesn't want to pay that cost and doesn't need it. We'll talk later about how we can get away from that cost. So let's make an observation about this calling code. Main calls this asynchronous algorithm and gets back a future, then it immediately attaches a continuation to it, right? It knows, even before it calls this algorithm, what the continuation is going to be. But since we have eagerly launched this operation and now it is running in a concurrent thread of execution, we are forcing there to be a concurrent access on the continuation field of our shared state. That is forcing there to be synchronization. Really, you don't need it. You don't need it because you already know what the continuation is even before you launch that thread, okay? So let's change this a little bit. Let's say instead that we pass the continuation in, right? So this concurrent thread of execution hasn't even started yet and you set its continuation field. Now, you're never going to collide on that field. You'll never have to do synchronization on it. We can get away from the synchronization overhead, right? Does everybody see that? Okay. So we have to change the algorithm to actually take this continuation, and what it does, it takes the continuation in, and then when it creates that thread, there's um, a, a lambda, and you're gonna need to capture the continuation in that lambda. And then when you're done computing your value in this asynchronous algorithm, you have to pass that value to the continuation, and then the result of that is what gets stuck into the promise, okay? Removed completely the need for synchronization um, in, in the continuation. Okay. Let's make an observation that is a little less simple, okay? 
This works because um, you, know, you, you pass in the continuation to avoid some synchronization, because it removes a race on reading and writing the continuation. Fine. We can achieve the same result by starting async work suspended, and letting the caller add the continuation before they launch the work. That is, you separate these operations of creating this asynchronous operation and launching it. That gives you a window. It gives the user a window where they can compose another operation before launching it. Okay? How would we, how does this look in the code? So let's take this asynchronous algorithm and let's change it to start lazily. And we do that by taking its entire body and sticking it in a lambda, and having this function return a lambda. Okay. It does no work. When you call this algorithm, it does no work whatsoever, just returns a lambda to you. The lambda is going to take the promise as an argument. Well, I did something a little clever here. This is no longer hard-coded to be stood promise. It could be anything that satisfies a, uh, um, a promise-like interface. Right. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, because that's important. Okay, so now this algorithm is returning a lambda. Now you can't chain continuations on it anymore by calling dot then. Lambda doesn't have a dot then number. So we write a then function. Right? The then function is going to do the, it's going to glom the continuation onto this, onto this lambda. And you can think of this lambda as a, um, a lazy future. Okay. Lazy because it's done no work. It's not going to do any work until you absolutely need it to. All right. All right, so this then function is going to take one of these lazy futures and it's going to take a continuation. It's going to return a new lazy future that represents the old lazy future and the continuation. Okay, then is just a generic algorithm. So let's look at what then does. Then is going to take your lazy future, which I'm calling task, and it's going to take your continuation, and it's going to somehow stitch these two things together. Right? So we know that task is actually a lambda that's expecting to be passed something, right? So at some point you need to actually launch this thing and tell it to go. So we know that at, we're going to return some lazy future that is in its body going to actually invoke this other lazy future. Right? We also know that this lazy future needs to be passed something like a promise. Okay, so let's gin up some sort of promise type. The promise, the interface for promises is there's a set value function that gets called when um, com computation has completed successfully with the result value, and there's a set exception that gets called when there's some exceptional situation. Your uh, asynchronous computation has completed with an error. Okay, but what are these functions going to do for the then algorithm? Well, it's not that hard. You're just going to be capturing the promise passed into this lazy future, and you're going to be capturing the continuation function, and in your set value, you pass the arguments through the continuation and you pass the result of that continuation to the inner promise's set value, okay? It's a lot like what we did on the other slide when we did uh, the continuation passing style, when we passed the continuation directly to the asynchronous al algorithm. It's the same thing, okay? A set exception is just gonna pass the exception through um, unmodified. All right. So, I have just implemented uh, task chaining as a generic algorithm, which is pretty neat. Well, notice here, there's no allocation happening. There's no synchronization happening. And there's no type erasure. Okay. That's pretty neat. There isn't even any asynchrony here. You might wonder about that. We're going to be layering in asynchrony uh, in a little bit. Okay. So let's go back to our, um, our main function. Now we can call async algorithm. We get back one of these lazy futures. We can change some operation to it using our new then algorithm. So what goes after that? 
Our original program was blocking and then printing. Let's imagine that we chain up another continuation that does the printing, okay? Well, still, at this point, nothing has happened. No work is done. We've just created a lambda. We haven't actually executed it yet. So imagine we execute it and we pass it in some sync promise-like thing. Sync is real simple. It just ignores its values and terminates on errors. Okay. Does that work? Well, this is horribly broken. First of all, we are printfing in the wrong thread. Okay. So this asynchronous algorithm has spawned a thread, and now we're going to be doing our printf in the thread that asynchronous algorithm created, as opposed to on the main thread. And that's not really what we wanted. But there's a bigger problem here. We're not blocking anymore. So what main is going to do, it creates this fancy lambda. It uh, executes it, which is going to spawn a thread of execution. It's going to go off, and it's going to execute some asynchronous code. And then main is like, my work here is done. I'm gone. Right? You know, undefined behavior, right? So we need to find some way of adding blocking back into this. That's not a problem because blocking is just a generic algorithm too. Let's look at it now. Let's call it sync wait. And it's going to take a task. And there's some, some lazy, lazy future. Now, in the um, solution as I've developed it so far, um, we can't really have, a, we don't really have a way of asking a task uh, what its return type is, right? Because we're using continuation passing style. Well, values aren't returned to the caller in asynchronous applications. They're passed forward to the continuations, right? So you can't decal type this thing. You're just going to get void, right? You want to know at the end, what is the type of the thing that's going to get passed into my promise. Right? So in this particular implementation of sync wait, we rely on the user saying, look, I'm really expecting you to get back a T, or just like an integer, whatever, okay? There are ways of cleaning this up, but let's go with this for now, okay? So what the sync wait algorithm does is it declares some shared state. Notice this is not an allocation. This shared state is just sitting uh, on the stack of this blocking algorithm, okay? Then we uh, create a promise that refers to that shared state, and we launch our task with that promise. Okay, so what is the state and what is the promise? State's real simple. It kind of looks like the shared state of um, the future object, right? You've got mutex, you've got a condition variable, and you know you're either going to get an exception or you're going to get a result. So you have a variant here that could either be empty, right? It hasn't completed yet. That's what monostate is, stood monostate, which is like the greatest name ever not. Uh, there's a, a variant over monostate exception putter and T. We'll call that data. Okay. Now the promise has to have a promise like interface. So it needs a set value and it needs a set exception. And it's just going to store a pointer to that shared state, okay? So set value and set exception, they're just going to be setting values in the, um, in the variant, you know? Value is going to set the value slot and exception is going to set the exception slot. The only thing that we have to do is we have to take a lock, right? And place the value into the variant at the right slot and then call notify1 on the condition variable. All right. Now we just wait for it to finish. And we wait until there is some, you know, some, the slot in the variant, uh, either uh, the first or second slot in the variant has been filled. All right. It's no longer monostate. And then what? Well, then we either got an error or we got a value, so we just either throw it or return it. If we got an error, we throw it. If we got a value, return it. Done. Okay. We just implemented future.get as a generic algorithm over lazy futures. Okay. 
So here's how we would use that. Let's fix our main function to call sync wait and then print, uh, print the result. Be cool with that so far? We have one more change that we want to make here. This algorithm is mixing in a whole bunch of concerns. Why is thread creation the responsibility of async algorithm, of this async, right? Maybe you want to run this asynchronous algorithm on some different execution context. Maybe you want to run it on a thread pool. Maybe you want to run it on the Windows thread pool or, you know, or Grand Central Dispatch. Okay. This algorithm is not as generic as it could be. So let's factor out thread creation into a separate function that creates a lazy future. We'll call that function new thread. And what it's going to do is it's going to return a lazy future, which is a lambda that accepts a promise. And just like before, we launch a thread. And then the only thing that this lazy future does is it completes. It launches that thread and then it completes by calling set value on the passed in promise. And you can, uh, on the passed in promise. Now you can kind of think of this as like a, you know, lazy promise of void. And new thread is returning a, a lazy future of void. Great, now we change our asynchronous algorithm to take a task as an argument. You can kind of think of that as like a predecessor operation. Could be something simple, like the return of new thread, or it could be something arbitrarily complicated. It is just a task, it's just a lazy future. And what it does with it is it chains its work onto that passed in predecessor using our then algorithm. And now our main function first calls new thread, passes that into asynchronous algorithm, right? And what this is going to affect is the creation of a thread and then the running of that asynchronous algorithm's work on that thread. Okay. New thread is what I would call an executor. Because it is a way you can parameterize an asynchronous algorithm on an execution context, where you want that work to happen. But you notice, I didn't have to define some new concept for executor. This is just a lazy future like any other lazy future. It satisfies all the same concepts. And it can be used in all the same ways in generic algorithms as any other lazy future. Okay. Okay. Sum up. Um, lazy futures or asynchronous tasks can be composed without allocation or synchronization or type erasure. Extremely lightweight. Composition is a generic algorithm and blocking is also a generic algorithm. All right. And you don't actually have to pay the cost of blocking until you, the user, says, I need to block. Right. So you can compose arbitrarily large uh, DAGs of lazy futures right. and only block on the whole thing, right? And all the different transitions from one lazy future to the other are done with no extra runtime overhead. Try doing that with futures. Okay, so I say this is generic, so we should be able to define the concepts. We can run through this pretty quick. Let's imagine there's a concept called lazy promise. And we're gonna be able to set value or set exception on this thing, right? So this, using concepts from C++20, this is what that looks like, okay? For various reasons, we're probably going to be calling set value uh, function call invocation. Okay. So this thing's going to look like a function, like a continuation function. It's going to have this extra uh, member function for you know saying if there was an error. Okay. Let's also add one other member function called set done. Set done, and we haven't really talked about how important cancellation is in asynchronous operations, but it's very fundamental, and we want it to be part of the model from 
the get-go. So if someone cancels an asynchronous task, then that task, when it gets a promise, when it gets a lazy promise, we'll just call set done on that thing. Said, you are neither getting a value nor an error. You are getting nothing, okay, because I was canceled. Now maybe your application doesn't use exceptions. Maybe you use error codes. So let's generalize this. It's no longer set exception, it's now called set error. And the concept is parameterized on the error type. And let's rename it, because people think they understand what you mean when you say promise. So let's pick a term that doesn't have all of that baggage. Let's call it receiver, because it receives a value or an error or it receives some cancellation signal. It's a little unwieldy. Let's refactor it a little bit. Let's say receiver um, is something that has set error and set done, and you could say receiver of Right? And then you could additionally specify, like, I'm going to uh, receive these value types. Right? My set value method, my um, function call operator, accepts those values. Okay. There's probably going to be more uh, constraints here, probably going to need this thing to be uh, no throw move constructible, but do you get the uh, basic gist? Okay. This is a sketch. Now, let's do the same thing for lazy futures. We say it's an, in, uh, it's an invocable, right? In my examples, it was just a lambda that took a, a promise-like thing, which we're now calling receiver. So, okay, lazy future is a multi-type concept. You're going to have this thing, the future-like thing, and we're going to have a receiver. So we have to make sure that we, these two things are compatible, okay? That's, that's the required expression here. And for reasons, we're probably going to end up calling that submit instead of function call. Okay. It's the same thing, though. And let's refactor this a bit. Sender, you'll probably have to opt into senderness. And we'll have another concept called sender2, which means that, uh, you know, I am a sender that can send to this receiver. And this is how you would constrain that function. Uh, one's a sender, one's a receiver, and these two things are compatible because there's a submit function that takes the two of them. Okay. So there, that's sender and receiver. Now you know most of what you need to know about doing asynchronous programming generically. Okay. All right. Let's talk about coroutines, because coroutines are how people are going to be doing asynchronous programming in the future. Coroutines are extremely important. Once you get used to the style of uh, asynchronous programming with co-await and co-yield and co-return, it's hard to go back, okay? So whatever we pick as an asynchronous abstraction in the C++ standard library, it had better work really well with coroutines. Now last year, I think it was last year, Gore gave a talk here about how to use coroutines to hide the memory latency of a pointer dereference. This is how efficient our asynchronous abstractions have to be. If our asynchronous abstractions are using stood promises and stood futures, you're dead. All right. It needs to be extremely lightweight. Okay, so let's look at a coroutine. Imagine, uh, imagine task here is some like a coroutine task. You have some helper algorithm that returns a task. You have some asynchronous algorithm, and it's going to co-await the result of calling this asynchronous helper. We know it's a coroutine because we have the co-await keyword in it, okay? And then we get a result. We get it asynchronously. Um, you know, when, when you co-await, it's kind of like a return statement, right? That function is placed in suspended animation. And then at some point later, it will be resumed and it'll pick up, pick up where it left off. Okay, those are the semantics of coroutines. I'm just sure, curious, a show of hands. Who here has used coroutines? Yeah, Lewis, I know you. Yeah. Okay, so that was maybe, uh, maybe a third of the room, I'd say, has used coroutines already. That's really awesome. Um, but I bet you didn't know that you were using continuation passing style when you were using coroutines. 
Everything after the co-await statement in this coroutine is a continuation, right? The compiler carves up your coroutine body, turns it into a bunch of functions. This bit of this function gets turned into another function, which you can refer to later with a coroutine handle, which is just invocable, right? Because it is a function. All right. So here's the part that really blew my mind when I first heard it. So if suspended coroutines are callbacks, and if callbacks are receivers, all right, you know what's coming next. Coroutines are receivers. And awaitables are senders. And I don't just mean this in kind of like an abstract sort of sense, not in like in a platonic sort of sense. This is like, this is concrete. This is real. We can reify this idea in our code by making all awaitables senders and making all receivers, all uh, coroutine bodies receivers. Right? We can make this work. Oh, I should say some senders are awaitables. You actually have to say a priori what its type is going to be. Kind of like I said, um, when we had to say, um, when we defined the value of sync weight, we had to say what its type is, right? Coroutines have that same property. You have to say what, what the type of a um, sender is in order to turn it into a, uh, in order to make it awaitable. So the standard library, should we decide to go this way, can make all senders awaitables by defining one global co-await operator that is constrained on this concept sender. Okay. Implementing coroutine types is a little hairy. I have slides. It all actually does fit on a slide, but I think uh, I don't have time to probably go through all of that stuff. Um, so uh, I will hand wave up here and say, I've done this. This actually works. All right. And what you get by doing this is if you write a sender type and you pass it into a, uh, into a function, that function could be a coroutine that could co-await that sender and get its result. And some senders are awaitables. Right? So here I have an example of a dumb sender and it declares that it's going to send an integer through its value channel, okay? There's a submit function that takes a receiver that's expecting an integer. That's good, type checking, awesome. And it's just gonna uh, pass 42, the integer 42, through the um, value channel of this, of this receiver. Great, it's easy enough to write a uh, sender. Now imagine I have a coroutine and it takes a sender. It doesn't take a task, it takes a sender. I can co-await that sender and I can get a result. I can get the integer back, I can assert that that integer is 42. I can do one other thing, right? I can call this asynchronous algorithm, I can get back a coroutine task, right? This is not a sender, this is a coroutine task. So somebody has implemented a co-await operator on this thing. I can pass that thing to our sync wait function that we wrote earlier. Sync wait doesn't know anything about coroutines. It's expecting to be passed a sender. No problem, this compiles, right? Because awaitables are senders. And I will show how the, um, I will show how that works. Let me back up here. Okay, so all awaitable types satisfy the requirements of the sender concept. So you could write an awaitable type, you can give it an operator co-await. You could write a receiver type that's got the receiver interface, it's got a function call operator, it's got set error and set done. And I can call submit on that thing, right? I don't have to use coroutines just because somebody's given me a coroutine task. I don't actually have to use coroutines. You can call submit, right? And use continuation passing style on your coroutine types. And real quick, this is how the submit function works when you pass it an awaitable. 
give it an awaitable, and you receive uh, and a receiver of whatever uh, the awaitable yields. And the first thing you do is you create a lambda. The lambda is going to be a coroutine. Inside the body of this lambda, you are co-awaiting the awaitable, and you are passing whatever your result is into the receiver. So this is like the one generic submit function that makes all awaitables function as senders. Okay, so there's this really nice correspondence between awaitables and senders. Right? And it's seamless, and it's efficient. Let's skip that part. Okay, once we have senders and receivers, what can we do? Like, what else can we do? All right? We have a lot of high-level functionality on top of it. So we've already seen some generic algorithms. We've seen sync wait, we've seen then. We can also have algorithms like when all or, or uh, when any. Uh, we can build uh, eager promises and futures from lazy senders and receivers, right? And that's pretty Im really important, right? Because you're not gonna be building your entire asynchronous program as one giant composed sender and then launching it in main. Chances are good, you're probably gonna be ripping off chunks of that asynchronous DAG and launching it uh, as you go. And you'll wanna be able to launch things uh, as you go. Uh, but you wanna be able to say, um, as a caller, as a user, you're gonna to wanna to say where you want to pay that price. You don't wanna pay that price every time you uh, invoke an asynchronous algorithm, just sometimes. Okay, so we can build eager futures on top of lazy senders uh, with no additional overhead beyond that which is inherent in eager execution. So when you execute things eagerly, you're gonna pay the cost for type erasure and allocation and synchronization. But that's just the nature of eager. So here's a future. It's got a shared pointer to some shared state. Now you construct the future from a sender. And this sender, right, it's a lazy future. It probably hasn't started yet, okay? So the first thing your future has to do is start it. It's gotta begin immediately in the constructor of the future object. So it's gonna submit this sender, and it needs to pass a receiver to it. It doesn't have one yet, so it has to gin one up. So it asks this, shared state to give it back a receiver. And the get function we'll talk about in a minute. So let's stick that there. Here's the state. This should look really familiar from the sync wait slide. Right? We have a variant. We have a mutex and a condition variable. We have this make receiver, which is going to return some receiver and we haven't seen it yet. And then our get function is going to do exactly what our sync wait function did, which was take a lock and wait until we have either a value or an error or done. Okay. Now let's look at this promise. I mean the, the, the receiver. So it holds a reference to that shared state. And then it's going to get a value or an error or it's going to get a done signal. And it's gonna do exactly what sync wait did, right? It sets the right slot in the variant, and then it signals on the condition variable that it has finished. Okay. And here we're kind of smashing the uh, cancellation signal into the error signal. You might instead decide to return an optional. Um, anyway, different choices are possible there. Okay. So we just implemented eager futures on top of lazy senders and, um, and receivers. So the converse is not true. You cannot lazyify an eager async operation while also removing its inherent overhead, right? If an, if an operation has started, there's no way to walk that back, right? You've already paid that cost. So lazy operations are more fundamental than eager operations in async. And that's really the key point of this talk. 
There's probably lots of different ways that you might want to eagerify a lazy operation. It depends on many things. There's probably going to be several algorithms like that. But remember, so far we've only been talking about concurrency. Right? Like David said, there's a difference between concurrency and parallelism. Right? If we can't also express parallelism in this abstraction, then we're not being generic. Okay. Unfortunately, in this talk, we don't have time to go into like a full analysis of how parallelism can be implemented in terms of sender-receiver. But I'll refer back to uh, this slide that David presented earlier about why the parallel algorithms are fast. Because they let the user communicate to the scheduler information about the lack of cross-task dependencies. Okay. In other words, when you call an asynchronous algorithm, that algorithm is going to build some uh, internal DAG. It's going to like carve up your, your range. It's going to farm out a bunch of tasks that are going to execute in, in parallel. Okay? So there's a DAG under there that you are not seeing. Right? And it is con these, uh, this algorithm is communicating information about this DAG to the, to the scheduler and to the compiler. And this is why parallelism can be made to work in C++, because there is some way of communicating the structure of this asynchronous task graph to the scheduler. But if you think about it, when we compose lazy senders, right, first do this, then do this, then do this other thing, right, what you are doing is you are building an asynchronous task graph. Okay? Your composed sender is a representation of your asynchronous task graph. Imagine we also have an algorithm like our then and sync wait algorithms for parallel fork, for creating a node in our task graph that parallel forks. Okay. So now our DAG has a fork in it and chained operations. And maybe there's a join also. Okay. Now we have this interesting asynchronous task graph represented as a DAG encoded in the type of our sender. And eventually, we're going to throw this whole thing over the fence to an executor to execute it. You're going to say, here is this DAG representing my asynchronous computation. I would like to schedule it for execution now. Okay. Well, that scheduler, it has the whole DAG. Right? If it wants to parallelize, it can. And it can do that because none of the work has started yet. So it gets to do all the shuffling, all the vectorizing that it wants to do. If those operations had been started eagerly, there's, there's nothing that a scheduler can do. You can't walk back those eager operations and say, no, 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 actually, I want to do it in this other order. Oh, okay. So by composing lazy senders, we're building a representation of the data flow graph independent of its execution. How that graph gets executed can then be left up to the scheduler. Laziness is the key to making this all work. Okay. All right. So, summing up, this is a quote from my boss at Facebook. It's very important that we design a system that does not only satisfy Facebook's needs or NVIDIA's, but it satisfies special case argument combinations for individual use cases, but one that cleanly generalizes for interoperation between different libraries from different vendors with different goals. Exactly. Right? This is exactly what Stepanoff did with iterators, containers, and algorithms. Right? Define an abstraction that everyone can program to. Okay. Send to receiver is a generalization of future promise that accommodates both eager and lazy async. Supports cancellation and error propagation. It composes with low overhead. Permits generic algorithms with efficient default implementations. Just because an algorithm has a default implementation doesn't mean you couldn't provide a more specialized one. Naturally accommodates executors as a special case of a sender. And it generalizes over concurrency and parallelism. And if I want you to take away just a single thing from this talk, be lazy. 
Here's some additional resources. Um, there was a great talk that David gave about the ongoing uh, saga of executors. There's going to be, um, there'll, uh, li there's a link here. Um, feel free to take a picture. Um, there's a paper that uh, is currently working its way through the committee called P1660. Um, it's got a sketch of this design, this executor's design, and some good per uh, papers um, by my coworker Co uh, Kirk Shoup, which uh, motivates a lot of the design decisions um, behind the sender receiver. And with that, uh, I think I'm done, and I'm um, happy for, uh, for us to take some questions. Hi, uh, can you go back to one of the slides with a the detached thread and the and a main function? It doesn't matter which one. Oh, yeah. So uh, if you're if you're um, bug hunting uh, for concurrency uh, issues, um, then for sure uh, detached threads uh, are are always a bug. Okay, I, I just wanted to point this out because yeah. If somebody goes and tries this, yes, 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 they will run into the undefined behavior that's in, on this slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you, I should have. Do you I have a thank you answer in your model to turn this into a question? Do you have an answer in your model of how to resolve this undefined behavior problem? Think wait. Yeah, the the way to resolve this. So first of all, um, new thread executor is is a terrible executor, and it should never be used. Sure. Okay, uh, except maybe on slideware and in tests. If you wanted to make something like new thread executor and you wanted to make it not have undefined behavior, I should have said uh, uh, when I uh, talked about this slide that there's undefined behavior here. You just never, ever detach a thread, period. Um, what you would do, you would have this, um, you would define some execution context which contains like a vector of threads, okay? New thread executor is going to just be pushing back into that execution context some new thread object, and then at the end of the main function, you're going to join all those threads. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. That was awesome. Um, I have a question regarding, so when you call call await, that suspension, uh, that resumption point can be sort of a receiver, and the receiver is more general because it's an overload set. Um, hmm. Could how can you generalize, or are there plans to generalize coroutines for? <laughs> That's a very perceptive question. So callbacks are strictly more general than coroutines are, as you've pointed out, right? Because you can have an overload set in your receiver, uh, and you can't in coroutines. You're kind of fixed to a single type, um, a single argument of a single type. Um, so uh, this has definitely been discussed on committee. Um, we have a designs for coroutines uh, that is uh, workable and it is great for a lot of use cases and in many cases that's exactly what you need uh, and we don't have a coroutine solution that is as general as callbacks are. Uh, uh, my coworker Lewis Baker has been doing some deep thinking about how we might be able to generalize coroutines in order to make them as general and powerful as callbacks are. Uh, but that work is uh, in a, a pretty early stage. Um, you know, and, and if uh, that ever came to fruition, um, what it would look like would be like a coroutines V2. Um, but um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's actually going to happen, um, just that uh, it's a possibility. There's, there's some symmetry there too, right? Because, um, because uh, awaitables can't do everything that cinders can do, right? Either, so it's it, it there's there's a connection here, and that's the point we're trying to make is that this is universal because it has this uh, bijection, this this connection in both directions. But it's it's not perfect, and there are, are ways to generalize in both cases. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Is there a um, library folks could pick up, um, Spirit of Range V3, to play with it early? So we have um, uh, 
what I would call a reference implementation uh, in the Folly library, Facebook's Folly library, that's a library uh, called PushMe. Um, and it implements an awful lot of this, not all of it. And uh, it is about, I would say, six months behind our current thinking on the issues. Uh, and so uh, certainly you're, you're welcome to pick that up and start using it. Uh, it's, it's not exactly like this. Um, but it's definitely close enough. Um, but I mean, these I ideas are, are really very simple. Uh, and it wouldn't be hard to, uh, you know, come up with um, solutions similar in your own code base uh, so that, um, you know, your asynchronous algorithms can be returning something like a sender instead of like a future. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you for the amazing presentation, first of all. Thank you. I was wondering, with coroutines, do you think it's feasible um, with current C++ syntax to construct complex um, task trees or task graphs, or do we need some sort of better or more efficient way to write down complex graphs? Absolutely. We, um, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but I sent a paper, an experience paper, to the C++ committee recently uh, where I shimmed coroutines on top of an existing task graph infrastructure in Cocos that we work on at Sandia. Um, and we were showing zero overhead there. There are all kinds of more complex structures of tasks that coroutines can handle that we did just did not have time to get into here, but are absolutely feasible and absolutely work with zero overhead. No. Interesting, thanks. All right, thanks for coming. And uh, enjoy the rest of your time.